Is there a gay gene? Is homosexuality rooted in the very core truth we are based on? If yes, should we ask ourselves why we seek such convincing evidence? Is it because we are pitying these individuals? Or is it because we need to point our fingers at the very fundamental tangible entities of our existence, our genes? Are we asking the right questions? What actually lies behind the curtain of homosexual genes? Is it genes or is it a personal choice? Or is it both? We shall strive to answer such questions in this video. Let us look at the convincing scientific evidence behind this. Let's jump to the conclusion first and then let's delve deeper into the scientific evidence. Now it is said that the search for the scientific basis of homosexuality has been given such limelight because it contradicts the Darwinian principle which says that homosexual genes reduces individual fecundity or fertility and that is why natural selection over the course of evolution would have eliminated these genes long ago. So why are they still present in the human gene pool? As a matter of fact, you won't find a shortage of every convincing evidence in the scientific literature. There has been so many studies to answer the burning question of homosexuality. We shall uh, strive to look into some of those studies. Well, from the various studies we looked into, the conclusion was this, that there was not one gene that uh, decides or influences sexuality in human beings but it's a combination of genetic factors as well as environmental epigenetic factors which influence sexuality as a whole in an individual. Now there has been studies to show that having multiple older male members in the family, uh, preferentially older brothers, increases one's chances of being born homosexual by 15% and 29% in two separate studies as you can see over here. This has been called the fraternal birth order effect. Now this has been suspected to have a direct correlation with the upregulation of the mother's immune system towards male antigens crossing the placenta in the mother's previous male pregnancies. Now it has also been seen that stress levels during pregnancy and also alcohol consumption um, inverses the sexual preference and predisposes to homosexuality. All of this is a finding which has been seen in mice. Now, remember the Darwinian paradox we spoke about that how are these genes which reduce individual fertility still in the human gene pool? Well, science is an answer to that as well. Uh, you see, the maternal aunts of the homosexual boys who were born they have an increased fertility rate, well, they at least have been shown to in this particular study which you can see over here. They have been shown to have an increased fertility rate to kind of offset the reduced contribution to the gene pool of that family which resulted from the nephew being homosexual. So it kind of restores the balance to the gene pool of that family. Well, what do you know? Scientific evidence goes as far as literally pinpointing the genes which are responsible for human homosexuality. Phew! So, end of video I guess. You got your answer. Or have you? Now that you've looked at so many convincing evidence behind uh, why a person is homosexual, you must be convinced that this is something which inherently can't be changed in a person and this is something which the person is born with and it's um, unchangeable, right? Well, now that you're convinced, if you are, let me tell you everything that is wrong with these studies. Number one, these studies have been conducted on a broad spectrum of subjects ranging from sexual behavior, sexual orientation and sexual identity and the findings from all these studies have been clubbed together into the broader domain of human sexuality. All the findings as a result are highly flawed because all have been clubbed together under the umbrella of studies of human sexuality or rather human homosexuality, but they are not. They are different kinds of studies. 
Number two, this data which has been gathered for these studies, they are highly skewed. Let me tell you why. Because they have been gathered from only those people who actively came out and provided us with the information, or at least provided the scientists who conducted this, these studies with that particular information. Uh, factors such as uh, personal and social acceptance of the individual, the confidence of the individual, they remain unknown and there are major variables which have not been considered. So these studies focus narrowly on a particular group of individuals. So uh, it's a big loophole which questions the outcomes of these studies. And number three, if you try to look up the studies that has been done on human heterosexual behavior, you'll find very few studies. The majority of the studies has been done on human homosexuality. So this is just my speculation, you can say it. But uh, maybe the studies on human homosexuality within the scientific community was seen as a potential to garner widespread acclamation and applaud. So we are just focusing at a particular demographic of people. Maybe because it would bust something unexplained like human homosexuality out of the metaphorical cage where it had lied, locked, unanswered for a long time. And finally, we see how the born this way argument is turning to be counterproductive and working against us in our quest for fighting against discrimination. Surveys have found that people who believe sexual orientation is something one is born with are likely to be more supportive towards the LGBTQ rights. It's simply wrong to discriminate against someone for how they are born. Thus, the Born That Way argument has been extensively used by the LGBTQ community in their movements seeking equality and fundamental rights. Makes sense, right? Well, let me tell you, it's not as simple as it looks like. According to this study conducted by Dr. Lisa Diamond, Professor of Psychology and Gender Studies at the University of Utah, with several women of different sexual identities, their sexual orientation did change over time which doesn't quite fit the conventional paradigm of sexual orientation being fixed at birth. It is true that sexual orientation more often than not expresses itself early and it remains quite consistent throughout the life of an individual, but at times it doesn't. There are numerous examples to look at. Consider the widely acclaimed rock singer Freddie Mercury, or pop singer George Michael, or computer scientist Alan Turing. All of them have been involved in heterosexual relationships in the initial years of their lives and later on showed a change in sexual preference. This is difficult to explain along the genetical lines. Thus, we have evidence that gender and sexual development show a lot more variability and fluidity than most people realize. And these variations lead to the change in sexual preference over time. But we also have to keep something crucial in mind here. The fluidity which we just talked about cannot be forcibly induced in an individual. Conversion therapies, shock therapies and hormone replacement therapies that many professionals have practiced over the years have not only been proved ineffective, but they are harmful and completely unethical. They might cause immense psychological damage to an individual. Following are some of the organizations that have criticized the conversion therapies. Studies conducted at Cornell University, University of Virginia and Harvard School of Public Health have collectively found that over thousands of different individuals have shown fluidity in their sexual attractions over time. Now, instead of focusing on what genetical alchemy makes a person non-heterosexual, let's talk about human mate preference in general. Now, if you consider our genetical hardwiring to be our hardware, then the epigenetics is the software. Factors like cognitive compatibility and similar schools of thought play a greater role in partner preference rather than the mere gender or sex of your partner. Now, this choice is along the same lines as uh, a heterosexual individual would also travel along in order to choose a partner. Our genes do not matter as much as in this regard as we'd like to believe. Uh, but surely we do have a bias. For example, 
We are biased in selecting partners on the basis of our own exposure to relationships when we were young and had tender and impressionable minds. These epigenetic factors at times matter much more than our genetic hardwiring. For example, there's a particular study which was published in 2004. As you can see here, it says that uh, children tend to choose their partners um, on the basis of the similarities that they find in them with respect to their parents' phenotype, that is their looks or even their character and personality. Uh, because children fashion a mental model of the opposite sex parents' phenotype, that is then used as a template for acquiring names. Uh, this phenomenon is called positive sexual imprinting. Hence, we can suspect a slim correlation between the mating preferences of an individual and the childhood conditioning that the person has been subjected to. Now, in the same way as we have seen that only epigenetic factors are unable to completely influence sexuality, we hence conclude that neither the genetic nor the epigenetic factors independently can determine someone's preference for a mate. Both of them are essentially two sides of the same coin. Both are equally crucial for the development of sexuality in a person. And finally, we have seen how skewed scientific data can actually be in this regard. So instead of looking any further into the engine under the hood of non-heterosexual behavior, we should support it just because it is the right thing to do. We do judge people based on their choices, starting from someone's grades to their fashion sense or even the kind of car they like. But that definitely has got nothing to do with the way society sees certain people in a particular untoward way. And it has definitely got nothing with the framing of public policies. Why will such a trivial thing like picking a partner or gender preference receive any different treatment anyway? It's just absurd if you think about it. Now there are various fuels that drive us deeper into discrimination. Delving so deep into finding a scientific answer to a question like why does homosexuality exist in the first place? It will only prove self-defeating because we're trying to find a scientific answer to a socio-political question like discrimination. It will just prove counterproductive and self-defeating and it will drive us headfast into the hunger pangs of discrimination at light speed. And I don't think anybody is alien to what discrimination can do and what discrimination has done to human society as a whole. Discrimination against someone's sexuality, discrimination against someone's caste, someone's creed, someone's colour. We've all seen the news lately. And it's not something new. You know the law of homosexuality which was present within the Indian constitution sentenced a person to 14 years in prison before section 377 in the Indian Penal Code was decriminalized. You know the rates of lesbian, gay and bisexual couples, youth actually committing suicide is four times higher than their heterosexual peers. In spite of section 377 being decriminalized in 2018, homophobia still exists extensively within the Indian society. As you can see over here, this particular news marks the one-year anniversary of decriminalization of the Section 377, wherein a lesbian couple committed suicide, along with a three-year-old child which belonged to one of them, because society wouldn't accept them, because the village from where they belonged wouldn't accept them. The section 377 of the Indian Penal Code read homosexuality is against the order of the nature except for the fact that it's not. There is a reason that nature has constantly maintained the viability of the homosexual gene in a statistically scarce manner that is not concentrated within any particular geographical or social boundary but is present in a constant fashion. There must be some reason for this self-defeating genetical factor to be surviving in the human gene pool and there is one way to answer this without conducting these studies with such skewed and imprecise data. Homosexuals are the glue that hold the human emotional connections together with their high emotion coefficients and their sense of establishing emotionally secure bonds between fellow humans. Now, 
let us try to put some perspective as to why we need a pride month and why certain people have to fight for basic human rights like legal protection and fairness in court just because of their preferences in a partner. Now this has got to do with um, the mental paradigms that we have ingrained within us. The scarcity of such people, statistically speaking, you know, which is biologically required, of course, to prevent the extinction of the human race as a whole, is what leads to the rarity of the choices that we make. And mind you, I'm speaking statistically over here on the basis of numbers of these people and not anything else. That is why the fail to become the normalized mental paradigm. Now, what are statistically inadept minds aren't capable of understanding or interpreting is that diversity is nature's secret weapon and it has been so for millions and millions of years of evolution. The recipe of a versatile culture is a mixture of many different ingredients. In the olden days when there was no social media and the sharing of information was also limited, People have greater difficulties in accepting the choices that LGBTQ individuals make. In the 1970s, homosexuality was considered as a mental disorder. Even in the recent past, the so-called rarity of this idea, in fact, fueled greater stigma surrounding it because it, it, it was not something people came across frequently and it consequently led more and more people to live hidden under the illusion of the already normalized and familiar heterosexual population. This became a vicious cycle and it led more people to create a cocoon and get inside it. Because going against the stream is not only difficult but also impossible if your life hangs in the middle. But we live in an extremely connected and small world today where the only excuse for not knowing something is being lazy enough not to do a Google search about it. We humans of the 21st century are a formidable part of the ongoing war against inequality. Inequality against anything, against caste, against creed, against sexuality, against color. The pattern of what is going to be the new normal for our future generation is in our hands. Let's not do a sloppy job while we're at it. Eminent biologist and writer E. O. Wilson says that homosexuality gives advantages to the group by specialized talents and qualities of personality. So you see a society that condemns homosexuality in a way harms itself. You know, we fail to appreciate the catalysts crucial to help connect groups of people together living amongst us. They are the emotional glue that makes our societies functional and viable for living. You know, we fail to recognize the importance of these individuals within our society, even as evolution intended them to be, because their presence is of crucial importance to the sustenance of whole human society as a whole in establishing emotional bonds between fellow humans and riding gaps between different societies and riding gaps between people in creating families those are going to stick together in spite of adversity you know every member of the lgbtq family deserves to fly high with the pride flag on their back all of us deserve to be loved or accepted at the very least it is one of the basic and fundamental principles of being a human being. It's all about acceptance. Acceptance on behalf of all of us. And we owe it to the very notion of being human.